back Rebels. Hi, welcome to episode three of season two. Yes, episode three of series two and this is probably the biggest podcast guest uh, that I've ever sat across from. <laughs> yeah, this interview definitely meant a lot to David. Yeah, oh I guess, I don't know, like I've been, oh well and I said this to her at the end of the interview, but I like, I've been in love with Amanda and her music for like over a decade, I first discovered the Dresden Dolls, which is her band um, in like 2006, 2007, something like that. This is definitely one of those cases where you've met your hero. Yeah. And they say never meet your heroes um, unless your heroes are fucking awesome, then definitely meet them. So, um, yeah, this did not disappoint. It was it was it, like it was just magic. Yeah. And listening back, like because we've we've listened back to the episode. Like it's one of the best, like I'm yeah. going to say best episode ever, but I'm totally biased because I love Amanda. It's but. definitely up there. It, like I'm believing the episode having such an adrenaline rush because it was so good and I was so inspired. And then I had a, a lunch meeting to go to and I got there and I was just like, for the first I think 15 minutes, I was just raving about how good this episode was. So yeah. you're in for a treat today. And um, we played, a, we played, a, I played a clip back to Adam um, yesterday and we both got goosebumps, oh, which really is great. Um, how we, how we end the episode. Um, and it's the, the talk about if you hear the creative calling and yeah, it's just, ah, magical. So good. Um, so this interview came about and it's, it's, it's so crazy. So I don't really feel like I've got loads of celebrity mates. Um, I haven't got loads of celebrity mates, <laughs> but, but, um, so this is how it came about. Long-time listeners will recall that one of our very early episodes is with a guy... I think guy, it was number seven. Number seven was with one of my best friends, Dave Kaur. And I don't get to see Dave that often, so it was actually really lovely to just have that time of no phones, just just having a chat yeah. with a mate. And in fact, you had to edit out loads of the Croydon chat, didn't oh, you? Oh, God. So whenever David gets together with anyone else from Croydon... Croydon. They just talk about Croydon for fucking ages. And I'm just there like, oh, for God's sake, not more about Croydon. And so how we had some very interesting Croydon chat that I think would have been <laughs> perfect for the podcast for all of our Croydon listeners, but that was sadly cut out. But that's going to be launched on the spin-off, uh, The Croydon Rebels, which is just Croydon David Rebels. chatting to people. <laughs> yeah, that's the new that's the new series. But, um, but yeah, man, uh, we had Dave on. And then after the episode wrapped, I was having a chat with Dave and I recommended to him one of my favourite books, which is Amanda Palmer's Art of Asking. And then he just casually drops into conversation. Oh, I think Matt Nicholson knows her. And I'm like, what? Our friend Matt Nicholson, mutual friend, uh, musician, amazing guy. And I was like, what? That's mad. And he was like, yeah, yeah. In fact, I think he spent Thanksgiving with her and Neil Gaiman at their house. <laughs> I was like, what? This is this is bizarre. So after about a year, because um, it was, yeah, it was about a year ago that we recorded that episode with Dave. Um, just things have been happening and I talked to Matt and Matt was like let me see what I can do let me we, talk we to we met him when we went out to New York didn't we yeah we did yeah because Matt, Matt now lives in New York so um we uh spent some time with Matt over there and then he was like let me see what I can do and then there was a few emails back and forth with different people and and yeah um it it happened and I just couldn't believe it because yeah like I said this is one of my heroes so it was pretty mind-blowing and I guess that just goes to show like I hate the phrase, but like speaking it into the universe. But when when you do tell people things, like things can happen. There is a kind of whole hippie side to it of just saying it out and just hoping something will come back. But then there's also telling loads of people, like no matter what you're doing, if you tell everyone you do that, if you approach every single person you know and say, I've just started this project, this is what I'm currently working on, and just tell them about it, because there's a massive chance that one of those people might be like, well, actually, that's interesting because... I know someone who's doing this. Like the amount of people who have been my friends who I've met told something. And actually a big project we've got coming off at the moment is because it's through a friend of a friend that I met at a party and we've now got a huge project off it because you just talk about what you're doing. Yep, we talk about planting flags. Plant as many bloody flags as you can. Do it. Yes, so um, shout out to my friend Matt Nicholson The uh, and we referenced it in this episode. Matt worked with Amanda on a track called Mr. Weinstein, We'll See You oh, Now. So and fucking good. Yeah, so we like fully, fully recommend that you go on YouTube, type in Amanda Palmer, Mr. Weinstein, We'll See You Now and watch the video because the song is really powerful, but added with the visuals, it's like it knocked us on our ass oh when we God, watched it. Yeah, so. it's, it's amazing. It's one of the best videos I've seen in a very long time. It's one of those things that I watched and I was like, I instantly need to share this with people. It's so good. 
Yes. But not as good as this episode, so do carry on listening first. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so anyway, enough of us um, fanboying out for Amanda Palmer. If you enjoy this episode, please share it and let other people know about it because um, it's one of those pieces of art that we want the world to experience and listen to. I think some of the stuff we talked about in this episode is so important. Oh, so, so much gold. So yeah, share it out and tell your friends. So let's get into the episode. Amanda Palmer is a rock star, an activist, an author, an artist, and a TED speaker. If you Google Amanda, you will find a lot of articles that focus on the brash Amanda fucking Palmer rock star persona. You'll find her mistakes well documented and you'll find outrage that she has the audacity to ask her people to support her. But we didn't interview Amanda fucking Palmer, the rock star. We interviewed a thoughtful artist who understands the complexities of making work, of asking for support and surviving as a creative in these crazy times. This episode, we talk about the art of asking, wearing many hats and getting back to your work. Hi, Amanda Palmer. Hello the show thank you for having me thanks for doing our podcast um adam's made me promise not to do <laughs> the entire interview i'm um, just asking you questions about the eight foot bride which i probably would because no let's <laughs> no, i've never done a complete interview just about street performance <laughs> and I, I think it's the best i think it's yeah. absolutely fascinating so um tell everybody who she is so the eight foot bride uh was my busking character it's my street performance character and I basically made my living from about 1998 to about 2001-ish uh, busking on the street. And I was, a st I was a living statue. I painted myself white. I wore a white wedding gown. I stood on a couple of milk crates that were covered by material, white gloves, black wig, long veil, vase full of flowers. And... Um, and I had kind of an urn at my feet and you could put in a penny or a $20 bill and I would give you a flower. And I had a great relationship with the florist in Harvard Square who would give me his, 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 you know, slightly wilted daisy palms. The off cuts, yeah. <laughs> um, and that's how I made my living for, you know, a couple of years. And I mean, also I was like a weirdo you know, weirdo boho artist living in, a, in an arts collective in Boston. So I was doing a gazillion other things for money at the same time. I was a barista. I worked at an ice cream store. I was a stripper. I was a dominatrix. I worked for a naming and branding company, like all, <laughs> all at the <laughs> all same time, all the things, <laughs> all of those things at the same time. I also, I was a clothes check girl at fetish parties at a, you know, at like a sex loft somewhere in Charlestown. I right, did. So you come in, get naked, and then we get I our clothes get to you. I you look after our clothes, and then I we would go. Be, I would be fully clothed because yeah. I was just working the party. Um, and like if you're coming to a sex party, and these were sex parties that people paid to get into, you have to put your clothes, put, put your somewhere. clothes somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so there's just a gazillion bags and tags, and I made 20 bucks an hour standing at the door and Amazing. checking people in. But I mean, basically, I would do just about anything for 20 bucks an hour. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so when it comes to street performing, how, um, I mean, people might say that's a completely unpredictable way of earning a living and you would never know yeah. how much you, and maybe you could stand out all, that, all day and not get any money. Yeah, it wasn't completely unpredictable. There was a spectrum, you know, and you could have a bad day. And a bad day would be like, oh, uh, you know, the weather turns shitty. For some reason, there's just something about the weather and the vibe in the street yeah. and people just aren't stopping. And I've been standing up here for an hour and I've only made $7. Um, but there was also, uh, I think I, and I think I mentioned this in my TED Talk and I certainly talked about it in my book. There was a almost uncanny predictability to how much money I would make in a given two hour slot on a Saturday night, I would make about $120, give or take. Yeah. And it was just amazing to me because I was like, all of these people are making random choices. How is it possible that it's always about the same? But you know, there is a flow and a rhythm to humanity. 
And it's sort of like a bartender at a bar. It's like, how many people are going to tip me tonight and what are they going to tip me? Well, at the bottom end here and at the top end here, and if I have an amazing night, I'll take home 500 bucks. And if I have a shitty night and almost no one tips me, I'll take home 50. But it'll be somewhere in between and still worth showing up for work. And I mean, the, the lessons, you know, emotionally, performance wise, financially, like the, the, the lessons that I learned, the education that I got standing on that fucking box was invaluable. I mean, it was just such an incredible way to be galvanized as a artist and as a performer. Where did that character come from? I, I had been, I had lived in Germany and I had traveled around Europe and I had seen a bunch of living statues and I'd seen them in New York too. Um, and I remember thinking even in my, like in my mid teens, I remember looking at these people and thinking like, wow, like who does that? Like, and who's allowed to do that? And then realizing, you know, I remember being in Germany when I was around 20 and thinking like, right, like anyone can do that. I could do that. I should do that. And I went and I was really excited by the idea. And I went to a secondhand thrift store in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. And I was like, I'm just going to find a costume. And I was just looking around at all. It was this giant sort of warehouse secondhand shop called the Garment District. And I just wandered around on, you know, one Saturday thinking like something will speak to me. And I was like, wedding dress, wedding dress. Oh, wedding dress. Perfect. Easy. White. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's a character that, that's a character. Like that's... It's kind of really lucky that you stumbled across a wedding dress because, I mean, you talk in the book about um, people falling in love with her. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I say like her because you always refer to yeah, well, the bride Well, and I mean, she was a really sort of tragic looking bride. I mean, the minute you paint your face white, it's, it's like I like you're not going to fall in love with the Tin Man or with Yoda floating on the thing. Yeah, you wouldn't. You can't, you no can't one fall would in have, love with them. No one, no one would have fallen in love with me if I had just been, you know, a, a Yoda character yeah. or a Disney character. <laughs> yeah. And those, and you know, and I have some pals who've been statues uh, in Hollywood and in Disneyland, and it's a very different kind of gig, you know, especially if you're playing a character and you're putting on an Elsa costume. It, I mean, it is in some ways physically and energetically, it's kind of the same gig. But this was. I mean, the the great thing I loved about this character and this moment is that it was a giant question mark in on the fucking sidewalk. Yeah, it was just there was no sign, there was no explanation, there was no meaning uh, except for what people brought to it, and people brought a lot. And also, this was Harvard. Harvard. I was in Harvard Square. I was not in like you know the shopping district of downtown Boston where it was just like you know, families and tourists and business people. Harvard Square has been a sort of a strange bohemian mecca in Cambridge, Massachusetts since the 50s and the Beats. And and it's Harvard. It's Harvard University. Yeah, it's where yeah. everyone eats, works, lives. And so it's a weird group of people. You know, lots and lots of academics, lots of like crazy professors, lots of families, lots of grad students, lots of... and. You know, and I became a part of the landscape there. Mm. And I had re- I had full relationships with people who I never knew. I never knew their names. I never knew what they were. I just knew that it was like that guy in the tweed jacket with the briefcase who always gives me $5 and sits there and seems to be saying a prayer and then walks away. Like, I'll never know. I'll never know who you any know, of these you people were. Because you never spoke were. to these people. No. Almost never. And occasionally, you know, it, what was so interesting is it was kind of like a performance. I mean, one of the interesting things that I found, I was I would get to the end of, let's say, a two hour. I usually wouldn't stand for two hours. I would usually stand for about an hour and change and then need to take a break. Mm-hmm. And this isn't like a stage show where like I'm doing something and then there's a finale and then everyone applauds. Like I would just stop. And sometimes people would be really confused and be like, are we clapping? And I'd be like, yeah, I'm, I'm done. And now I'm a person again. And I would get down and, you know, very often people would come up and want to talk to me. Like, what is, I, I mean, I can't, I, if I had a dollar for every time someone said, so what is this? <laughs> like, what is this? And I was like, I don't know, you, what, you tell me what this is. Yeah, yeah. 
you just saw what this is. And, and I got a lot of um, gifts and weird offerings and people would sit there and write and draw and leave messages and letters and um, joints. Like it was, <laughs> it was just, a, it was, a, it, but, but, but looking back at that, you know, I just did a show in Portugal two nights ago and I left with a bag of sculptures, poetry, weird plastic hands that people had given me, like, it, it hasn't stopped. I've just changed venue. <laughs> like, <laughs> my life is still really similar. And, you know, and I, I loved that as an, as, an, as an iconoclastic artwork with no institution attached, no boss, no real structure. Just like here I am standing in the street making an expression for you. I mean, I, in a lot of ways, like graffiti, like this is just here. Yeah. This is just here for you. And then you get to have your own conversation with whatever this is. I mean, do you think that everyone should at some point try <laughs> street performance? Because like, because you mentioned the graffiti there, like I've been in the streets for 19 years yeah. and you see things and you meet people and... Yeah. It's just such a, I mean, there's there's one street artist that I know that puts up a sign that says no photos um, and don't talk to me. I know, yeah. No, but no, who put up the sign? I'm not gonna say his name, I'm not okay, gonna put no, him on blast, but this is, this is a street artist, okay, yeah. Okay, go, 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 yeah, go. so he, he, put, he, puts up, he puts up this sign. But when I'm painting in public, I feel like if we've chosen to be there and make our art in front of everyone, like we you kind of to, have a responsibility. Yeah. I have yeah. a responsibility. And so, I mean, there's one guy around here who was really nervous to come up to me in the beginning, like homeless guy. And I think that's probably because people don't normally give him the time of day. Yeah. And like now he just makes a beeline. So, so I go like, here he comes. He comes straight to me and we just have this great little chat. Yeah. And at that moment, it's not about him being a homeless person and me being a street artist. It's just, I suppose it's just a connection because you talk about like the connections that you made and it's just two people having a conversation. Yeah. But I mean, I remember once... I remember once with my friend w walking to get to somewhere where we shouldn't have been painting. And in order to get there, we had to cross a golf course. <laughs> and so we're walking across this golf course at about five o'clock in the morning. And I mean, I didn't know fucking golfers went out at five o'clock in the morning. There's people out playing golf at 5, 5 a.m. Um, and like, I knew if we were coming back. So we'd, we'd done our naughty, naughtiness and we were actually coming back. So we're walking back through this. And I just turned to my friend and I was like, that's so fucking weird. And like, looking back, I know how stupid that is because obviously all of these golfers were like, who are these two kids just yeah, coming walking. out of this bush, walking across our golf course? What the fuck? Hello. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, but we're both in our little bubbles, yes. just living our little lives. And then sometimes they intersect and it's yes. just mad. Well, so that is, I mean, that is what I loved so much about street performing. And I mean, also, like, I, I can still go back, you know, it's like this touch point that I keep going back to mm -hmm. and thinking about what that period of my life did to me and made of me. Because it, the poetry is infinite and endless. Like, it just, I keep going back to the way I was sort of forged on that street corner and thinking like, wow, like, right, like, that's why... That's why this, that's why this, that's, you know, that's why you can't take your state of mind for granted. Like most musicians haven't stood on a street corner silent for three years. Like that did something to you. And one of the things that I'm feeling right now, you know, even just like right now today doing this podcast is the, the hardest thing about standing up on that box the first day was... You know, and you sort of also do it as a graffiti artist, but you're a little more protected because like you're, you have a task. It literally felt like standing up, you know, in front of humanity and like opening up my chest and saying like, okay, you, you get to do whatever you want to me. Let's see what happens. This is scary. It's a huge amount of trust. Oh my God. And sca really scary things happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It wasn't all wonderful, like, you know, flowers and, and tugs and poems. Like, I got assaulted a couple of times. Yeah. And I knew that that was a risk. Because I was literally standing there 
in a defenseless position. I mean, with my hands out like that and my chest bared, going like, I'm here and open to you. And, and I'm still like that. that. That's still the like main posture of my art all the time. And sometimes it is, most of the time, is amazing and fulfilling and overwhelmingly wonderful. And then sometimes, like, I get hit. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and then you sort of, like, go into your corner and you go, like, cost, benefit, cost, benefit. And I always wind up back there in that same position, whether it's on the box or on stage or in my writing, going, like, it's still worth it. It's still worth it to open myself up and be vulnerable, even if people are going to aim and fire yeah i think you're you're kind of the unlikely tag team of you and um, Brene brown yeah it's like the most awesome combination well it's why i asked her to write the forward to my book yeah. because i was like you no one gets this more than you no one really really understands the complicated intricacies of what i am talking about when i talk about the art of asking as a as a you know as a full as a main life philosophy no one gets that more than Brene Brown who literally sits there and thinks about it all day <laughs> and studies it and studies the science behind it um and I love that like she comes at it from a scientific approach and I come at it from an artistic approach but guess what it's the same fucking thing at the end of the day same results yeah. same statistics same problems same shame so yeah, and I mean, and I love that, you know, she says in her introduction, she's like, you would think that this woman and I had nothing in common. You know, she is taking her clothes off in a rock and roll club and I'm in church. <laughs> but we're the same. We're still the same. Is it okay to get paid to do art? I don't think anyone should be paid anymore. I think all artists should just die. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, of course it is. It, without without the well how else is the art going to happen is yeah. my question i mean that to me that question answers itself yeah. if, why do we have so much um shame and and reluctancy about actually pay, like charging people for our art i have thought about that for years and i really i mean when i got the massive backlash of hatred first for just using kickstarter and then for going out to my community and done something in doing something that I had done many times, which is like, hey, who wants to show up and contribute? Which was just the that was just de rigueur for me and my community and the Dresden dolls. You know, we toured for years and years and years and years, and there would be street performers and hula hoopers and living statues and painters and people with typewriters in the fucking bathrooms of the venues. No, none of those people got paid. It was really like, who wants to join the circus? Like, bring whatever you want, come join us, be part of this in incredible thing. Um, and and I really, really, you know, the backlash was so furious. Were you taken aback by that? I really was. You know, and I really was and like a lot of the sort of kerfuffles in my life, you know, I found it really easy to dismiss at the beginning. I was like, oh, this is just, you know, this is just one mm. angry, uh, aggrieved musician who just graduated Juilliard and is angry that she can't get a job. And so she's taking it out on me. But watching it escalate, which it did, I mean, th that exploded and still occasionally explodes on me, especially when like new things come up and if someone wants to make me witch of the week, it's like all oh, those stories get dragged out. You know, Amanda Palmer didn't pay her musicians. Amanda Palmer killed her boyfriend. Amanda Palmer is, you know, <laughs> secretly Illuminati, whatever. <laughs> and, and yet, you know, none of these explosions ever happen for no reason. You've got to, and I always stand back and I examine it and I go like, okay, if I take me emotionally personally out of this like what is going on with people mm. that that this is hitting such a nerve and i think especially in 2012 a lot was going on with people the music industry was collapsing the economy had collapsed there were a lot a lot a lot a lot of musicians out of work and and looking at the the safe future they thought they had built and watching it 
you know, dissolve before their eyes. And there was just a massive amount of fear. Like that one, you know, that whole kerfuffle was kicked off by one classical French horn player writing me a letter saying like, I think it's people like you who are ruining my chances of getting a job. And I was like, you know, she's not the only one. Everyone, you know, because the economy tanked in 2008, everyone who just like took out all of their student loans and paid $120,000 or $200,000 to go to conservatory to, you know, hopefully like get their slot at the Boston Symphony Orchestra or, or whatever and isn't. And none mm-hmm. of these people are getting jobs because guess what? All the arts funding is dried up and no one's getting that job. They have no one to be angry at. And so, you know, like enter me going like, hey guys, come play violin at my show. Here's some beer. Like while that had been something that I had done regularly for years, the intersection of, you know, my perceived wealth, which by the way was bananas because my Kickstarter didn't really actually make any money. Um, My perceived wealth and privilege next to what was happening with the music industry and the economy next to you know the fact that i was just a woman sort of giving a middle finger in general to the music industry like i think all of that collided but you also like you always have to look at the context of why something like that explodes and i think a larger context around all of that is that artists don't like touching money they really don't and i think there's a really legitimate and important reason for that which is if you look at the whole span of human history and I mean all of it you know not just like since the 1800s like back to our our dawn of time art and money you know have had a very or have been very very strange bedfellows and any artist who's just in it for the money isn't really a good artist Mm. we just know that And we know that what art has been capable of doing in the long span of our culture before like this newfangled commercial capitalism hasn't been about profit, hasn't been about fame, hasn't been about, you know, impressing people and winning their approval. It's been about this group of people like connecting with each other, wanting to share their stories with each other, wanting to reflect pain, grief, joy at each other. And money doesn't actually belong in that conversation. Mm. But the way our world is built right now, it's built very differently than a tribe of a couple of hundred people who have their artist and have their shaman and have their person who goes down and gets the water and like, and everyone is just like, okay, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, and when we circle up around the fire tonight, like who is the one who's good at playing drums? You, awesome, okay, you do that because I have no rhythm, gotcha. Like now let's tell the story about what happened. And there was no financial exchange going on there. There's plenty of exchange. You know, an artist an artist shouldn't ever be a taker. You know, an artist is just part of society showing up with the gift that they have the same way the doctor is, the same way the shoemaker is. Like, we have a gift and we show up and we're like, okay, like, where's our place in the circle? And, you know, the the problem with art and capitalism is that, like, they'll, they, they'll never quite fit together. Because how can you ever really put a price on what looking at a piece of art does to you? You just can't. It's not a shoe, you know? And we all know that. We know that as artists. We know that as the audience. And this is why I think it has been so easy for the gatekeepers and the middle people to like usurp the entire narrative and make it about them because we are sort of fed this story that the artist must be separate from you know the exchange the money you know the dirty business that's going on in the back room and I will continue to maintain that that's not good for us because it endangers both sides, the one offering the art and the one 
who, who could be there to take in the art. Because you put someone in the middle going like, all right, you guys, like, I've got to, you know, you're going to do this. And, you're gonna do... and like, it, it, there's, you know, there's a lot you could say about a lot of those people in the middle. Because a lot of those people in the middle are really good helping people who are like, no, I want to facilitate. I want to make sure that your story and your painting and your book and your song gets to the people who need it. How can I help you? And I, I, you know, I have found in the last 10 years, my biggest job as a business person is to identify those people. The people who are like, no, 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 no. Like, it will be great if we make some money, but that's not the point. Like, how can I help? Mm. How can I help facilitate artists and audience? And any time I find myself identifying one of the people who's like, yeah, I'll facilitate, but like, we'll make some money. I'm like, nope. I'm like you. Sh I'm not the artist for you. You need to go work with someone who wants to make money. I want to make connection, and I need money to make a connection. But in the hierarchy of which of those things is more important, I know where I'm at. And if you're not there, we shouldn't be partners. <laughs> <laughs> that's a long answer, but I have a lot to say about that at the moment. So yeah, no, that's all good. So the reason that you decided to kind of take up the Kickstarter was because you um, had had a falling. And I think you're, when you're talking about like your perceived wealth that people were plastering onto you, I mean, we know through the amount of, of music artists that we've had on the show, like getting a record label does not equal bucks. It's like, it's not oh, just because you get neither signed. Neither just doing it? a Kickstarter. Well, okay. It all so what, costs a lot of money. So you decided to do the Kickstarter because yeah. you'd, um, you'd finally got released from your label after a, a bit of a battle yeah a um, battle but yeah so so talk us through that that process of thinking actually i could do this myself right well it's funny you should put it that way because i think the most important thing to remind people at this juncture of the story is that i knew i couldn't do it myself and that means yeah. that means i needed a team of people who were not overlords but were helpers mm -hmm. you know my inside team because there's no way I was gonna try and figure out how to replicate what a label is able to do, you know, at my kitchen table in my underwear. Um, and um, more importantly, my community was gonna have to get on board. So, you know, I always find it really funny, like DIY is, is such a paradox because everything you look at that's DIY is actually people doing stuff together. It's mm -hmm. never people doing things alone. Like the definition of DIY is like, you know, me and my friends are doing a thing. Um, and, you know, I, I had a very steep learning curve with the Kickstarter because, you know, it, it wasn't like most things on Kickstarter, it wasn't just a you know, it wasn't a charity pot. It was mm. a record pre-order. I had to make, manufacture, and distribute, and, you know, proof, and deal with damage, da-da-da-da-da. Like, I made a product. And, you know, we made this beautiful packaging. There were amazing editions of the album. There was an incredible book, um, you know, with art, with, uh, with um you know, sort of album-related art by tons and tons of artists. We did a touring gallery show. I did house parties. You know, it was it, it was explosively huge, the amount of effort, work, and energy that went into, um, you know, what was sent out to those 25,000 people who pre-ordered the record. It wasn't just a vinyl and a CD. It was like a gigantic you know, art explosion. I think there were 10 tiers of stuff. And, um, and you know, I spent that year being a touring artist, touring with my band, you know, delivering all of these in-person house parties, doing gallery openings with all these people's artwork and stuff. And also, and, you know, as soon as I got off stage, I was like, oh my God, like that shipment to New Zealand didn't make it. Holy shit. Oh fuck, what are we going to do? Okay, we're going to have to send another shipment to New Zealand because none of those people got the, their turntables. Oh my God, these people got their turntables, but like all of the paint was chipped off. So like, do we have any extra in the warehouse? Oh my God, all of those extra ones went to the warehouse in LA. Like that was my life for a year. Mm -hmm. It was like running a small business 
that I didn't even know how to run. And, you know, my management at the time had never done anything like this before. Like, no one thought about what the shipping bills would be internationally. Oops. (laughs) They were $300,000 that we hadn't really remembered to budget in. Like, we... we, And, and in moments like that, you're like, ah, oh, right, like major labels, like they've done this a lot of times. They know that you have to pay to ship things to New Zealand. <laughs> but still, like I made all of those mistakes joyfully because I was like, even if at the end of the day this Kickstarter makes zero profit, which pretty much at the end of the day it made zero profit because of all of the, um, you know, the miss, the mistakes and the, like, and the lack of forethought and the... You know, the fact that any time anything went wrong, I would just throw money at it. I was like, oh, my God. Like, and, and I was so excited at certain points in the Kickstarter that I was like, yes, like, everybody gets an expensive thank you card. I don't, whatever. I'm sure it won't cost that much. <laughs> oh, my God. It cost so much. And then they had to be shipped to New Zealand. So, like, it, it, it compounded and was ridiculous. But I, I still maintained and I wouldn't take back a single moment of what I maintained, which is even if it breaks even, it is what they would call in business a loss leader. Because the amount of trust, goodwill, and proof of concept that it created between me and my community was gold. Relationship gold in the bank, which then when I started my Patreon, showed itself it was like sticking a bamboo shoot in the ground and waiting three years and then it finally exploded because i just needed to remind my community that they could trust me and that i wasn't a charlatan and a shyster and gonna take all their money and just run away to mexico and send them some shitty product i think it's important for the industry as well because that shows to everyone else that this is possible look someone's gone and done it now and yes the economy is awful but this shows how things can change for the future if you develop an audience. Right. And I felt, again, like I felt this oversized responsibility as the Kickstarter poster girl. You so know. that's it. As soon as it raised a million dollars, then you're queen of the internet, queen of crowdfunding, all of these right. names are getting thrown at you and you're getting the, the negativity and the positivity and everything. Right. So I couldn't fuck up. I could fuck me up. I could fuck up my own bank account, but I couldn't not deliver... And in lots of ways, over deliver what I promised my community. And that was sort of like, you know, on the blackboard of my virtual office that year was like my community and what I promised them is all that matters. I don't care about anyone else. I do not care what any magazines say. I don't care what the music industry says. I promised these 25,000 people really specific things and amazing experiences. And that's my work. That's my job. And that's who matters. And that's what I served. And that's what I still do with my Patreon. I have 15,000 patrons who have given me their credit cards forever. And that's who I focus on. I don't focus on whether or not the press thinks that I did a good or bad thing or made a good or bad song or, you know, like... That is just going to cycle and come and go as it always has. But my relationship with those 15,000 people exists outside of, you know, it even exists outside of social media. It exists in a sort of a low walled garden that costs a dollar to get in. But once you're in there, it's not about the court of public opinion. You know, I did something the other day that I've never done before. I was in such a dark place. I was at this show in Portugal. And I had a couple of hours to kill between soundcheck and the show. And I didn't want to get on the internet. I've been staying off the internet just for it because I've been taking a detox mental health break. And I went to the basement of the theater and I, and I wrote a song, which I haven't done in a long time because I've been touring and busy, but I sort of did it as a, like, you know, I have to, I have to make I have to make something right now. I have to express something right now. And I literally just like wrote it in an hour and a half, two hours, practiced it once, recorded it with my iPhone, put it up on SoundCloud and sent the link to my patrons only. Didn't charge them for it. I was like, I, you know, and I technically know you guys will encourage me to charge you for this, but right now I'm, I'm just in like survival triage mode. But 
you know, getting the letters back the next day from the people who were like, man, I, you know, I listened to this song while I went for a walk on the beach this morning and I cried. And the woman who wrote me a note saying, you know, I always listen to music with my dog sitting there on the floor and he never moves. And in the middle of your song, when you were clearly crying, the dog jumped up on the bed and started nosing the phone and making whining sounds. Cause he, he was, <laughs> and I was just like, these, this is my community. Like th these are the people that I want to hang out with. The people who are just there to like support, receive, converse compassionately. And you know, I also, I learned so many lessons in 2012 and 13 about the media, about the court of public opinion, about the internet, and about, you know, where I spent my time. And I found myself, especially in certain episodes in 2012 and 13, going, if I spend my artistic time and energy defending myself on Twitter for six weeks, yeah. what am I not going to be doing? What am I not going to be making? And who do I want to give my time and energy? Do I want to give it to these music industry people who think I'm terrible? Do I want to give it to these trolley people who think I'm a bad feminist? Do I want to give it to these sexist people who think this is all happening just because I'm Neil Gaiman's wife? Or do I want to spend that time and energy on the community who gets me and, you know, and make meaningful art for them, for me? for whoever is gonna show up. And I really had to come to Jesus back then and was like, right. Like, I'm not gonna let that distract me from this. It will be a net negative if I do that, if I spend my, my life and artistic energy in defensive mode instead of, like, as I was as the statue, back on the box mm -hmm. in open-hearted mode. And I'm just gonna have to accept that it's going to be hard and constantly tempting to go like explain myself and defend myself and explain myself and defend myself. And I have to remind myself every day, that's not your job. You're an artist, you know? How much of your time do you reckon you spend split between creating art and engaging with your community? Well, one of the best answers I can give to that lately is, um, there's less separation than there used to be between those two activities. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I loved about making this last record is that my Patreon, um, you know, and not that I couldn't have done this on my blog back in 2007 because I, the, techno the technology was yeah. certainly there, but I have a kind of relationship with my 15,000 patrons that I didn't ever have with Twitter and that I didn't ever have with my blog readers back in 2003 or six or nine or whatever. And, you know, they're invested. They're paying me their like money. Yeah. They're yeah. literally invested. They're literally, whether they're paying me a dollar or a thousand dollars, they're paying my bills. They're paying my staff. They're paying for my piano tuning. They're paying for my travel. They're paying for my office rent. They're footing the bill. And they know that that doesn't buy them any entitlement about what kind of art I make. They know that that's the deal. Mm -hmm. And yet, when I go to them and I roll my sleeves up and I say, okay, you guys, here's a blog. I have a prompt for you. I'm going to write a song tomorrow about abortion. I want you to comment below and tell me if you could say anything to someone who is going to get an abortion tomorrow, what would you say? And then the time that I spend reading those 1,500 comments and crying during most of it, especially because I see that even just the act of committing some of those things to words has been healing on the other side. And I know because I'm reading it because there are people, you know, there are women sitting behind their computers going, wow, I've never actually put this into words, but I needed to hear this so much myself when I was 18 and da, 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 da. And, you know, that's quote unquote, engaging with my community. It, but that's, but changes. that's my job. And then, and then it turns into art. So, you know, to me, the beauty of that question is like, I don't know, how can I merger those two things so that they aren't even separate? Because it changes your initial idea as well. So you'll have 
you'll have an idea for a song and then you get all of this feedback from people so i've heard you say the the ukulele song you you like you edited it so that you could fit in all of the wacky things that people yeah. were saying to you that was the fr- actually that ukulele song was the first time i kind of crowdsourced a list of lyrics yeah and and that was you know and that was fun and i did that through twitter the abortion song wound up being voicemail for jill which is one of the best songs on the record and i didn't literally cut and paste or lift anybody's comments but those comments wrote the song yeah you know because you 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 couldn't help but be in a certain kind of headspace after reading that many comments from that many people written that compassionately and not f- feel whatever it was that I felt when I then sat down at the piano and said okay what do I need to say in a couple of minutes that will capture the essence of what those thousand people said and that is an amazing honor to hold as an artist you know in a way like that's if I could do anything if I you know if I got to have my nine extra lives right now one of the things that I would love to do is go back to school to study you know a certain kind of ethnomusicology where I trace this particular lineage you know like where is the where is the line between, you know, artist and healer and shaman and medicine man and like this role in society where, you know, people need someone to express whatever's going on in the emotional zeitgeist or whatever just happened with our war-torn country or whatever is going on here with sexism. And I mean, artists have been doing this since day one someone you know someone who is creatively endowed gets to take the temperature of the group and say okay i think i know how to express this in paint i think i know how to express this in song in dance in sculpture and if the artist is good at it the whole group will look at that creation and go oh yes thank you for helping us explain what it is that we're all feeling right now like that's a good artist who can do that and it and the medium is irrelevant you know when an artist is at their best they're not recognized because they're some kind of genius they're recognized because they have tapped into the rest of the crowd and expressed something important at that time and place i feel like there's a something you could create in within that like instead of having to go if you go instead of going back to school you could create some form of documentary or something around experts in those fields to put together and answer those questions patreon thing yeah (laughs) (laughs) sounds like a good one yes well and i mean one of the interesting things about patreon as a website is that these questions are coming up all the time because patronage obviously has a history and anyone, you know, over at Patreon is thinking about these things. And it's sort of like, let's not pretend that we're ripping up the script and starting from scratch here. We're not. We're actually going back in time and, you know, and just using technology to do what people have been doing forever, which is like basically, you know, here we are in the room. There's the hat. Throw in a dollar if you feel so moved so that I can have a you know so that i can buy a sandwich tonight and have a place to sleep and keep doing this tomorrow in the next town for the next group of people who might appreciate it that's old school that's not new school and you've always kept that old school mentality so i think for a lot of people listening to this the the thought of fifteen thousand subscribers on patreon is a very lofty like that's that's in their like deep future for a lot of people listening um but the way that you've got there is old school. It's one person at a time. It's th- like five people listening in a pub gig, yeah. and then so like so your journey has been just just grabbing the ones that get you along the way, just bit by bit. Yes, and that and that should be. I would like to think that that would be every artist's intention. You know, one of the things that I just have always found 
not confusing because I used to buy it. You know, when I was 12 and like looking up wide eyed at Cyndi Lauper and Madonna and Prince and Michael Jackson, I was like, okay, like if I want to be an artist, I need to be that. Like I need to be huge. Everybody needs to love me. You know, and I still have like, oh my God, like painful vestiges of that. Like if it's really working, everybody needs to love me. Superstardom, you know, that sort of narrative that we're that we were all spoon fed by MTV and like block the age of the blockbuster. But actually, you know, the older I got, the more I realized that that was a, first of all, a losing game because look at a lot of the people who became superstars and gauge their level of happiness and ooh. Um, and also, you know, I realized the thing that was driving that desire to be loved by everyone, to be Madonna, to be Prince, the, the, the fundamental driving desire was to just be seen and connected. Mm -hmm. That was it. And for so many artists, that's just the fundamental building block. Be seen and connected, provide connection for others so that they may see themselves and see the world differently. Which goes back to the bride on the box. That's what you were providing for people. Yeah. Yeah, a moment of connection. And I mean, and I still love that and do it in my career. Nothing's better than an unexpected moment of connection. Nothing beats that for me. There's no more satisfying feeling than I had no idea I was going to be at a gig in a field an hour ago, but here I am because... It happened that way. And I have never seen the kind of joy that coming out of people than the kind of joy wrought by spontaneous, unplanned. I haven't been looking forward to this for six months. It just happened. And it's and, and here we are. Uh, and I still love doing that, you know, and I and I will never forget how those moments I mean, those moments of standing on the street and watching someone in their sad, anxious, who knows, suicidal life, you know, just like walking by me and then just all of a sudden sort of popping out of their haze and looking at me and being able to make eye contact with them. And I think it's so important that no words were used because that just would have made the whole structure fall. And really looking at someone in the street with this bizarre little, you know, strange street performance etiquette that allowed for us to look at each other. And oh my God, the number of people who burst into tears because some weird stranger woman who they knew they would never talk to, never have to talk to or never m meet, um, looked at and acknowledged them and didn't, um, turn away from their gaze like people would cry and that and seeing that happen to so many people taught me how unseen people feel on the daily and how locking eyes with someone for more than three seconds is not allowed in our society I mean it just makes if you do it at a party you'll just get like Oh my God, you're a creepy, obsessive stalker. Just, yeah. uh, what are you doing here? <laughs> but when you're a street performer, you're just like you're just like slapped with this magic wand of like, you get to look yeah. right into people's eyes and not look away. And oh my God, like it was fairy dust. And I get to do that on stage. I get to do that as a performer, you know. And I I think I think there's a lot of that missing right now. Mm. You know, and I think a lot of artists, you know, one of the things, I mean, this is going way back, but like one of the things that, that um, set the Dresden Dolls so far apart from all the other bands in Boston in 1999, 2000, is that like we, we like literally wanted to hold our audience's hand and like look at them and be with them and talk with them and hang out with them and on stage laugh with them and joke with them. And like we were an eye contact band in a sea of shoegaze because that's what was hip at the time yeah 
I mean, we were in, it was just post grunge, Boston, flannel shirt, all male, four piece rock bands. And if you did not look at the floor, you were mocked and laughed at as we were for being completely unhip. And we were like, we, sorry, like we just will not buy that. We have a different belief system. We do not want to look at the floor. We desperately want to connect with these people. That's what we need. I don't know what you need, dude. <laughs> like, I need that. And again, like, same theme. You know, art is about mutual recognition of fill in the blank. Which is not to say that shoegaze is bad. It's not. But, but I mean, what you but, built is sustainable because whoever was, whoever you had that connection with then, they stuck it's around. likely you still yeah. have that connection now. Whereas, yes. I mean, how many of the bands that were shoegazers are still are still there? Like, well, many? yeah, and I mean, I tell I tell a story about this in my book, and um, you know, there was an indie band that I was pals with, and I loved their music, and we had you know done some shows together, and I remember having a conversation with one of the guys in the band, and he was like, Amanda, you know, we just can't do it like that. It's not what we do. Like, we don't even talk about merch from stage. You know, we, that's, that's great that you can do it. It's great that the Dresden Dolls can do it. It's they great. They wouldn't mention that they're selling t-shirts. They literally or... wouldn't mention that they were selling t-shirts, you know, and they were a great musical act, you know, like amazing band, amazing music, whatever. And I was like, that's cool. I'm not saying you have to. No one is saying you have to. And and actually, I didn't even get to this in the book because uh, this didn't happen until recently, but many, 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 many years later, um, that same band came to me and said, we're struggling and we've started a Patreon and we need some help. And I said, well, I can't turn back the clock, but you are going to have to shift some of the attitude about I can't sell merch from stage. Don't forget that if people are standing there and have come to your show, they're there for you. Mm -hmm. They're your community. You're allowed to ask them. It's okay. You can do it in a way that does not feel uncomfortable to you. And you know, I if I had like a dollar for every band, you know, this is one of the things that I hate seeing. If I had a dollar for every band who on stage did point to the merch table but like f had to sh cloud it in five extra minutes of self-criticism of like, this is the terrible part of the show where we're assholes and we tell you that we've got some shit for sale because we have to do that. Sorry that we have to do that. And it's just like, you could have just said, Hey, there's merch yeah, yeah. and saved a lot of time and energy. And you know, you don't need to apologize to your own community for asking for the support that they want to give you. That is the, one of the most fundamental things that a lot of artists need to learn to em embrace and get over. Like if you're talking to your community, they're at your show, you know? They're at your show, they are your people. They do probably wanna know that you've got merch for sale because they might wanna buy your yeah. record. You don't have to live in a cloud of shame. It's fine. I suppose then that gets down to, and I've heard you talk about this before, the difference between asking and begging. Mm. What What's the difference between the two? Asking is, hey, 500 people in this room, we've got shirts for sale over there. We'd love it if you bought one. Begging is, you guys, we're really broke and we don't even have gas for our fucking van tonight. So if you don't buy a shirt, you're an asshole. That is begging. <laughs> yeah. That yeah, is it's, begging. It's, and you um, and and everyone knows the difference. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you can feel it when you hear the person asking yeah. if it's begging. Begging demands. Begging demands. And you don't want A asking just informs. Asking informs and allows for any kind of action or reaction from the other side mm -hmm. it, it it you know it it informs and it it invites 
but it invites, you know, it invites without nagging yeah. and it invites without co coercion. And I mean, this is the thing. There are a lot of artists who get this wrong. And there are a lot of artists who put up crowdfunding campaigns or try to hawk their wares with a kind of a like irritating, you know, um, entitled, pleading, obnoxious neediness that really does piss people off. And every artist I know, including me, has had to try to find the sweet spot between, you know, asking and demanding and informing and, you know, coercing and whatever. Like, there's never a right way to do it. And there's no guidebook there. And, you know, the, the, the problem with all of this is that, you know, no one wants to seem entitled to help, to money, to support, to having your video or your work shared on the internet or whatever. But you also have to act with a certain amount of belief and love for your own work that inspires other people to want to help you. So if you go out to your crowd saying like, hey, I made this, I made this piece of shit, maybe you'll share it on the internet. <laughs> Everyone knows what that tone feels like. And everyone also knows what it feels like when someone says, hey, I made the best fucking video ever. And everyone has to fucking share it because it's the most amazing thing ever. This thing is going to go viral. Like, that's also just not the right tone. <laughs> Somewhere in the middle is, hello, crowd. I know that you have supported my work before. I hope you appreciate this offering that I have. If you like it, share it. I hope it brings you some joy, you know, love the artist. Learning how to speak that way to your crowd is a, is a part of the toolkit of being a direct to audience crowdfunding person because you're the one out there making the pitch and you can get it wrong. And your own community can call you out on getting it wrong. My community does that to me. My community occasionally comes to me and they're like, hey, Amanda, you're being too ASCII. <laughs> you're sounding too entitled. And then I back up and go, okay, sorry. Thank you for calling me out on that. I'm yeah. sorry that I have hit you with too many emails in the last week asking you to buy merch or whatever it is. And if you have a good community, they will feel safe enough to tell you that and you will be humble enough to take their feedback. And if you have a team like me, talk to your team and be like, hey, we've been too ASCII this month. Maybe we should dial it down. Um, and, and it's an endless process because it's always a moving target between spending your time creating and then taking your stuff to the marketplace and asking and you know being on stage in the circus tent and then running out to the front of the circus tent going hey there's a show inside <laughs> I have to go run back and put my wig on like and so many artists can relate to this now because so many artists are wearing 10 hats mm -hmm. you know you're like literally on stage you're also backstage doing the rigging you're also backstage painting the sets you're also at front of house selling the tickets you're also like designing the poster you're also getting on your bike putting the poster all over town and tweeting and instagramming and like trying to be trying to do every single job and you know and it can start to feel like your actual artwork is just the side hustle to getting people into the circus tent and that is you know if there is a if there is an exhaustion right now you know that's the exhaustion is just that there's so much work to do to get people into your tent to actually get to that moment where they're standing there and admiring your offering whether it's a painting or a sculpture or a song or a book you know and that balance of like how much time am i actually spending making art for people versus like going out into the marketplace and like clanging the bell saying like hey over here there's some art you might like um that's like the ultimate art paradox of our times and every artist i know every 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 artist i know is struggling with this one but i also 
think that in in the there's nothing new under the sun department this is not a new struggle for artists you know the same way art and commerce have always been strange bedfellows and you know in a difficult impossible tetris i think the artists you know uh imbalance between how much time making art and how much time to do the hustle you know, I think you go back to the first cave painters and they were like, I don't know, should I keep working? <laughs> should I keep working on this horse or should I go tell people about it? <laughs> and, you know, and I think it will always be thus. But I think as audiences, as people on the other side, because I'm sure people listening, there are plenty of people listening to this podcast wondering like, oh, like if I'm not the artist, but I'm the helper or I'm the supporter or the patron, like what can I do to help? I think just being cognizant of that is almost enough. Know that if you're in a relationship with an artist, that struggle is a painful and an inevitable part of their life. And just be forgiving that they are constantly trying to strike the perfect balance. So true. When you when you were talking about the screaming about like this video going viral, it's really interesting because we're talking off mic about um, the Mr. Weinstein video, mm. um, which I mean, me and Adam were both saying is like one of the most beautiful pieces of art that we've ever seen. It's just an incredible video. Had I produced something like that, the temptation would be to be that screaming person of like you all have to see this it's so <laughs> fucking important yeah. like i mean we're watching this as like as males from the for, like and just seeing the the female perspective and the struggle and everything that's tied up in that video is just is fucking beautiful and heartbreaking and and everything it's just everything that video and like to this to the point where both of us were like glassy eyed after mm -hmm. watching it and we're like wow that's a f like so i would be like the whole world needs to see this video but I suppose for you, you're like, my people need to see this video. So you don't get kind of caught up too much in the, this has to do a million views or whatever. You can't. And I mean, if I, if I struggle with anything, and I really do struggle with this, it is trying to find the compassionate and tasteful balance between offering up a piece of work like that and just letting it speak for itself and hoping to God that it will rise and be shared by virtue of its value. Yeah, I think that's the important thing. It's like creating content that is good enough or creating something that's good enough that you don't have to be the one to tell everyone about it yeah. right. as long as you can tell if it's good enough you can tell one person that one person will tell two people and that keeps happening yeah. then everyone will find yeah. out about it except i have been making and putting out art in many 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 venues but most especially on the internet for whatever 20 years yeah. And I have come to the conclusion that, I mean, as I think we all have when we take a big step back and look at the internet writ large, the valuable content does not always float to the top. Mm. And it can feel so painfully unfair that the artists and the content and the media that is the most clickbaity, you know, gets the most eyeballs. And if I have struggled and had a dark night of the soul in the last, especially in the last five or six years, it is, it is the struggle of trying to turn off the mechanism in the back of my artistic, um, you know, creator brain that is trying to aim and um, create conditions for someone will share this because I don't want to be that artist mm -hmm. and I don't want to be that writer and I don't, I don't want to be that person. And yet we know what the internet rewards. And it rewards outrage over nuance. It rewards, you know, 
screaming atrocity over considered conversation. And the same is unfortunately true with art. And it can be so difficult making art in those conditions. You know, I think I wrote a I wrote a blog post several years ago saying, you know, I knew things were dark the minute I actually sat at my computer considering whether or not to attach a picture of my child to my tour dates because I know I knew it would um, improve reach. And that is a fucking dark reality mm -hmm. to be an artist sitting there at your computer and knowing that that's even, you know, and I didn't do it, but the fact that my brain, you know, who my brain that is very conver conversant and taught by Facebook algorithms sat there and, and thought, oh my God, you know, if I put a picture of Ash on these tour dates, and I just, like, the bottom dropped out of me even watching my brain consider the decision and the value and the cost-benefit of attaching a picture of my baby to my tour dates. And it's in those moments that you discover who you are and you're just like, nope, I'm just not going to be that person. And, and so something like the Weinstein video, you know, I put it out and I hoped and I prayed that it would rise on its own merits, and it did. And yet, you know, I still like as the as the as the perpetually unsatisfied, you know, artist. I wanted, you know, I wanted more. Yeah. And I could even see my ego that week, going like, "Why not more? Why aren't more people seeing this? Why isn't it getting more reach? You know, why why hasn't a magazine called? Why why why?" And that. Again, it's just like the mindfulness practice that you do as an artist is you watch your brain asking all those questions and then you sit back and you go, oh, there's your ego. <laughs> Interesting. You know, don't let your ego grab the keys to the car. Like, get back to your work. Always get back to your work. You know, you're not getting enough coverage. Get back to your work. You want to you know, you want to scream at the internet that life is unfair, get back to your work. You know, your community is screaming at you. Say hi to your community. Try to explain. Get back to your work. Get back to your work. It is the best revenge you can exact on your ego <laughs> or the media or, you know, or the trolls or anyone is you just get back to your work. I fucking love that. Turn this podcast off right now and get back to your work. Yeah, stop listening to us talking. <laughs> get back to your work. Well, um, Neil says something differently. Uh, Neil says something similar in a, um, in a, in a great uh, commencement speech he gave to a university in the States. And it's the same, you know, same soup warmed over. He said the, the, only, the only answer to any of the trials and tribulations of, you know, life, press, bad luck you know, divorce, <laughs> exploding cat, whatever happens, when you're an artist, you always have the option to go and make art. You know, ho hopefully, preferably good art, but I would say don't even make good art, just make any art, make anything. It doesn't even need to be good. Some of the best art that I've made was the art that I allowed myself to make because I just needed to, I just needed to scream from my heart and I gave myself permission um, to allow it to not be good. And some of those, you know, some of those cries in the dead of night wound up being some of the best songs on my record. They don't have choruses. They're 10 minutes long, but they're, <laughs> but they're really good. And, you know, and that's, that's something that I think as an artist, you have to remember is a feature, not a bug that you have, if you have a means to creative expression that works for you, that can ameliorate pain Oh my God, you're lucky. You're one of the lucky ones. You get to do that. And, you know, it's also why I encourage every artist, not just to like, not every person, you know, because we were talking about this before the podcast. I don't think every person with a desk job secretly dreams of being an artist, but the ones who do listen, listen to that voice and run <laughs> because you have, if you feel a calling, you have you have an exit door and if you have a gift to give, oh my God, give it. The world needs it badly. And if you're feeling called, go. Like you only get this one life and this one chance. You do not want to be on your deathbed whispering 
to your beloved that you wished you had followed the call and that you wished you had been an artist when you really felt the call. You've got to do it. Amanda fucking Palmer, where can people find you online? Funny you should ask. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You can find me, you can just Google Patreon. I mean, it's the internet. Google, uh, I, I, I post frequently to my Patreon. I'm on Instagram. Uh, I'm sometimes on Twitter, Facebook, you know, I sort of, I slut around all sorts of social media, but the, the main event is my Patreon. And one of the things that I love about my Patreon is that my supporters over there aren't just the supporters of my music or my podcast or my videos, but they're just supporters of the philosophy. A lot of them are there just to continue this type of conversation about art and survival. And they don't even listen to my song downloads when I send them. And I'm like, that's fair enough. If you're just here for the conversation about how to get through, (laughs) how to get through the day creatively, I will have that conversation with you constantly. And I post to my Patreon at least a couple times a week. And, um, and the gold on my Patreon is actually the comments section, Mm. which for the internet, is unusual. (laughs) You know, I always read the comments on my Patreon because there are some smart motherfuckers with a lot of beautiful, insightful, intelligent things to share with the world. And I love that the comments section of my Patreon gets to capture a lot of that and people exchange beautiful stories and ideas and reflections. And, you know, often the comments are better than the the stuff above the cut. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you.